And speaking of speaking later, um, I'm going to introduce Cheryl Mullahan, our um, presenter for tonight. And I spoke with Cheryl prior to us uh, getting together right now and asked her preference for interacting, um, asking questions and um, comments, et cetera. And she asks that if you all wouldn't mind, if you could hold your questions and comments until the end of her presentation. And she has saved time for a great Q&A um, and discussion afterwards. And this is something that's probably gonna be near and dear to many of our hearts. And um, so there might be a lively conversation. Um, and already comments are coming in. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, there are actually, there is more than just Cheryl uh, with us tonight that are a part of this uh, Bobcat study team. I see Carrie Baldwin. Um, Carrie is also a part of this uh, Bobcat study team. And then Ronald Day, you see him. He's joining us tonight as well. Uh, they are all a part of this Bobcat study and it's great that they could be here with us. So they might be able to answer some questions as well. And then there's Cheryl, who has put together this presentation and offered to give this to us, which is awesome. I've actually known Cheryl for more years than either of us probably want to even like, or could remember um, before some of you were even born. <laughs> we were uh, in school in wildlife ecology at the same time. Uh, I was at the University of Arizona and she was somewhere up north. I don't know where, some black oh, hole. Some <laughs> But uh, we were also a wildlife um, society students together um, during that time. So I've known her for many, many years. Cheryl finished at that other school and worked for many years at the Arizona Game and Fish Department. She also then lived out east in um, Ohio. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. And um, out there studied um, not bobcats, but um, uh, a, a different kind of rat that we don't have here. But she's continued to do work on that. And when she returned back to Arizona, uh, got engaged in studying bobcats. And ultimately, her interest led her to her work here at Tumamak Hill and the Tucson Mountains, uh, along with the rest of her team. So Cheryl, uh, you can fill in any of those blanks or just jump right in. Welcome. Thank you, Thank you so much and take it away. All right. All right, great. Thank you so much, Trika. You did a great introduction, by the way. Um, so this is Bobcats in Tucson, a study of Bobcats along the urban wildlands, wildlands interface. And it is um, primarily funded, at least so far, by a grant from the Game and Fish Department Heritage Fund, which is lottery dollars for wildlife. So if you buy lottery tickets, uh, you're part of that. And uh, our 501C umbrella is the Southwest Wildlife Conservation Center, which is up in um, Scottsdale. And so by all means, check out their website. Uh, as Trika mentioned, there is a crowd of us. Um, Carrie and I are co-coordinators. Um, Al Account, uh, another game and fish uh, biologist retired, also my husband. And Ron Day, who's also on board tonight, is, was the fur bearer biologist, among other things, at Game and Fish. Um, two veterinarians that have volunteered their time, and that has been huge for us. And we have an amazing map guy who's um, in all the way with us now on Bobcat stuff. And luckily, someone who's going to do the statistics for me, Susie Prangy, who's a biologist I work with in Ohio. And then finally, a person who kind of invited herself into the group, and she's our photographer and website person. So an awesome group of people to work with. So a little bit about me. Um, I did work on Bobcats in Ohio. Uh, it has been a lifelong passion for me, and I would have been an even grumpier old lady 
uh, if I did not get to work on wild cats. And so in 2012, I started working with the Division of Wildlife uh, on that project for three years. And as Trika mentioned, um, also a little endangered wood rat that I'm still working on in Ohio uh, <clears throat> called the Allegheny wood rat, which is a great story if you're interested in conservation biology. It's a whole class in and of itself, um, worth checking out. <clears throat> so before I start in with bobcats, I always like to talk a little bit about cats in general. So again, one of my favorite topics. So the essence of cat, first of all, most highly evolved of the meat eaters, and we're talking about highly evolved, we're really talking about adaptations and cats are very extreme in their adaptations. Um, highly specialized killers, obligate carnivores. So an obligate carnivore is one that eats meat. And in this case, primarily catches and eats their own meat. So they're not, don't fit in as a scavenger at all, although they will sometimes do that. But we think of them as obligate carnivores. <clears throat> Amazing senses, uh, eyesight, hearing, sense of smell. People are always telling me, I've never seen a bobcat. And I always tell them, I guarantee you, if you've been out in bobcat habitat, bobcats have seen you. They just didn't bother to show themselves. Amazingly well adapted. Also a lean, flexible and athletic body that we should all envy. Uh, they're remarkable in the things that they can do uh, in things that they in places they can go. So one of the reasons I love to talk about cats in general is a cat is a cat is a cat. And all members of the cat family are remarkably similar in their adaptations. So when you're talking about one, there's a lot of that biology and a lot of those adaptations that go right into uh, the other species. <clears throat> Even the one that many of us live with every day, the domestic house cat. So if you live with house cats or have lived with house cats, pay attention because you'll see many of the things that I talk about and apply to bobcats also apply to house cats, including the fact that they'll bite and scratch you whenever they want, um, which, you know, go figure. Okay, so a couple of things that I, I can't go by cats without talking about. And one is intelligence, because this is probably the single most common argument I hear about cats is how smart they are or how dumb they are. Well, the truth is they do have large, well-developed brains. This is a scientific fact. This is true. Uh, even if I am a cat person, it is a true fact. That said, how they use their intelligence is different than how we often apply that. Um, so if you think of something like a dog and think of intelligence, cats don't go there. So there's some great little sayings that have come up over this disagreement. My favorite is you can train a cat to do anything at once. Uh, you don't see cats doing anything in the circus except growling and snarling and snapping. Um, another one, I had this one on a coffee mug. Cats know exactly how you feel. They don't give a damn, but they know. And then from one of my favorite authors, Robert Heinlein, women and cats will do as they please and men and dogs should relax and get used to the idea. I love that one. <clears throat> so another thing that's kind of hard on the heels of intelligence is attitudes. And a lot of people who don't like cats think that cats have an incredibly elitist attitude. And a lot of people who do like cats know that cats have an incredibly elitist attitude. Um, again, lending itself to some good posters and sayings. Thousands of years ago, cats were worshiped as gods. Cats have never forgotten this. Dogs have owners and cats have staff. I love that one. I have a dog too, by the way. And then attitude is a little thing that makes a big difference. <clears throat> I had this cat. This was Bob of the Serengeti. Um, I learned a lot from him. Okay, so let's talk about the biology part. So when we talk about cats as predators, uh, they have huge feet. Uh, you can see this is one of our, uh, this was our big male from back in Ohio. He weighed uh, 25 pounds. And you can see the size of my hand and his foot, his feet are huge. This is a lynx and he is reaching out and grabbing a hold of um, a snowshoe hare who's not long for this world. So they reach out they grab, they hold with the paws, okay? So they don't kill with the paws. They hold with the paws and then they deliver a killing bite. So 
the short face of cats uh, lets them open their mouths really, really wide. And you can see these are the killing teeth. These are the canines. So it can open their mouths very wide. They have that very short face. It gives them a tremendous amount of force behind that bite. So the canine fit teeth actually fit into the neck vertebrae of the prey, like a key fitting a lock. So for instance, mountain lions and mule deer um, fit together really well, unfortunate for the mule deer. Um, there are a lot of nerves at the base of the canine and they literally can feel where that's gonna slip in. And then once they put that bite in, that's gonna deliver uh, at least a, uh, it will at least deliver a paralyzing bite, even if it doesn't kill them. This picture I love because this is the ultimate, a cat is a cat is a cat. This is a tiger, which by the way, weigh up 700 pounds and which is big pony, small horse size. Um, and you can see he's doing exactly what we just talked about. This was from India. I don't use very much from the internet, but this guy went on a couple hundred safaris before he was finally able to get this picture. Um, very cool. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about bobcats. Um, they are a member of the lynx genus. There are four species of lynx. There are two here uh, in North America, the Canada lynx and the bobcat, two in Europe, the European lynx and the Iberian lynx, which by the way, the most endangered cat and an amazing story. So if you're interested in cats, check out the Iberian lynx story. Um, all dependent upon rabbits and hares to some extent. And a lot of people know about uh, things like uh, the, the um, Canada lynx, for instance, and the snowshoe hare, and very similar dependency with the other two species of lynx. Uh, very characteristic, long legs, huge feet, short tails, the follow me spots uh, behind the ears. <clears throat> So bobcats, one of the things that has made bobcats different from the other three species is they have a way more flexible prey base. I think rabbits are always a preferred prey, but they are not tied specifically to rabbits. So they consequently had a huge range, really all of the lower 48 and into Mexico. Uh, they disappeared for well over, from well over half of that range and have since uh, repopulated every place there's habitat. So across most of the lower 48 and down into Mexico, we have bobcats again. They are sit and wait, stealth, and camouflage predators. They literally look like a part of the environment is moving. That's the best description um, that I can get, They act, that I can give. They actively use camouflage, which I found fascinating um, when I was working with radio bobcats in Ohio that they will actually hide, they freeze, they do a lot of things um, to make themselves invisible. So this series of pictures is from uh, a bobcat over at the Sweetwater Wetlands. And uh, he's focused in, he's watching, he leaps and comes back out with a smirk on his face and a nice little fat cotton rat. Uh, very efficient. I think that he, that John who took the pictures told me he caught 10 or I mean three in about 10 minutes uh, that day. <clears throat> so what do they eat? Well, again, rabbits are probably always first. We talk about desert habitats. We have a tremendous diversity of rodents, both abundance and variety uh, in, the, in the desert. And I know that that is a constant staple for bobcats. Uh, if you ask what we saw on cats, which is the questions that we are asking for this study, once again, rabbits and rodents are part of that. Uh, some places in urban areas, like golf courses, for instance, have super high rabbit densities and also really good bobcat habitat. But they do have some other options. Um, we've already gotten pictures of our radio cats sitting under people's bird feeders and hunting under bird feeders. So I think that one of the uh, things that's gonna get added to our study that wasn't there in the beginning is some way to assess uh, how many bird feeders there are in a neighborhood where one of our radio cats lives, uh, as well as water, because they use that a lot as well. Uh, 
This is another one of the um, sweetwater cats. And, um, you know, they will readily go in the water. I'm sure that wild, uh, that wildlands bobcats opportunistically take waterfowl anytime they can, uh, but it's probably more common for some of our urban cats. And then the other thing is just species that do well with humans. So things like wood rats, for instance, um, probably make up a pretty good share of their diet just because they're a species that we often find in high numbers uh, in urban areas. So one of the big questions that we're asking is, do they in fact prey on pets or domestic livestock? Um, and this is already proven to be uh, an important point of conflict in the study. We did have at least one bobcat that um, I'm pretty sure was killed because he was um, hunting someone's chickens uh, in their yard. And um, so that, that came front and center more quickly than we would have liked. Uh, but there definitely is conflict and there is fear. Uh, we, um, right after we started the study, I got this picture. This was a female. She had three big kittens with her. And you can see the chickens in here. And um, they were very persistent. They, they didn't get the chickens, but they were certainly persistent. And uh, so that really got us thinking about it. And then having the mortality. We are asking people in Tucson to take a survey about living with bobcats. And you can go to the website. It just takes like five minutes. Where we're, what we're seeing from that survey, just in preliminary idea, is that most of the fear and conflict really does center around pets and domestic um, livestock. So that seems to be a, a point of friction and we're really hoping that we can help to mitigate that uh, as we go along. But bottom line is if you have chickens, you wanna have a chicken fort because big white birds that make a lot of noise are uh, magnets for, for bobcats. So the, probably the biggest question we're asking is what type of habitat do bobcats prefer, bobcats that live in Tucson? So this was a big one and we spent a lot of time thinking about it and looking at the possibilities. So you have wildlands, what we call altered but open, golf courses fit this perfectly. And then the whole range of urban, everything from, you know, very dispersed high-end housing all the way down to very, very dense, uh, housing with very, very little uh, open space. So we spent a, a lot of time thinking about that. And what we're really trying to do is really let radioed bobcats show us what's important to them. Where do they hunt, rest? Where do they have their kittens um, in an urban environment? By the way, all of these pictures are pictures that people have sent in um, of Tucson bobcats. So we spent a lot of time picking a study area and we ended up on the west side, mostly because we're on the west side, but also because we really wanted an area that had a tremendous amount of variety as far as ownership. So this is a county property, Tucson Mountain Park is here. This is Saguaro National Park, Sweetwater Preserve, Felix Paseo. So there was a lot of variety there. And then along with that, there was a variety of um, different types of urban habitats. Again, everything from, you know, really um, urban to, to very dispersed and, and a golf course with a uh, star pass. And we did want to um, have the golf course. So that's how we picked our study area. Um, and, and the study area was really the place to start. That is where we were going to trap bobcats specifically. And our goal was, that each bobcat that we captured would have within their home range uh, available to them all of those different types of habitat because then they're showing us what's important to them. So we're capturing bobcats uh, along that wildlands urban interface in West Tucson, fitting them with radio collars. Uh, they're amazingly sophisticated radio collars. They are GPS and satellite based. I can communicate with them I can send them, essentially I send them an email and I can make changes in the programming. Um, right now with our females, we're getting four locations a day and we're getting those every day because we're in the middle of kitten season. 
but the rest of the year we get two locations a day and we get those about every four days. Um, this is always also a mortality study because that's an important question to answer if, uh, if cats don't live long enough to reproduce successfully, you are not going to continue to have a population. So the mortality rate is important. So what happens is if the animal doesn't move for four hours, uh, I, get a, I get an email and not a good email to get by the way. And then um, I get a location. And when I go out in the field, that color, the pulse that I can hear has doubled, which is telling me that it's moving. It can be that the cat got the collar off, uh, or it can be that there's the cat's actually dead. And then, and this is an important point, and, I, and this has been a, a place that we got some pushback um, at the beginning of the study and still do from some people. And that is that we work really hard to make these collars so that they will come off, so they don't have to wear them the rest of their life. So they have a program, an internal program that we set, uh, two years for the males and 16 months for the females. So I set an actual date when the collars will come off, they open and, and fall off. I can also send it a command at any time uh, and tell it to, to drop the collar off. And it will tell me if the battery is getting low and things like that. <clears throat> so how do you catch a bobcat? Well. Actually, Ron Day is on the board and Ron's really responsible for our success as far as our capture goes. Um, these are traps that he built and you can see it's got a door. There's a treadle back here. Uh, in the back is everything from a little fuzzy mouse, which you can see right there. And remember, a cat is a cat is a cat. There's a little piece of uh, rabbit roadkill there's some sense um, commercial lures and uh, some bobcat poop and some bobcat pee. All you're trying to do is get him in the door. Okay, so we set these in places where we think bobcats travel, um, washes, travel ways, so on and so forth. This one was actually set in uh, a backyard on the golf course. One of the more interesting things we used as bait was this jackrabbit and we actually did catch a female in one night with this and her name is Bunny. Uh, she lives over um, West Sweetwater Preserve. So if all goes well, we check our traps in the morning and you have this very pissed off bobcat who's not at all impressed with wildlife research at this particular time. And this is Bobcat Dave. He was actually the other Bobcat uh, that lived on Tumamoc. And um, he's the one that I'm pretty sure was killed because he was hunting chickens. So this is one of our veterinarians. This is Dr. Erica Johnson. And she's injecting him. This is Ron back here. And what we've done is we have uh, Ron develop these. They're, they're basically uh, something to squeeze this down so that he can't really get away uh, and run around in the pen while she's giving him the injection. So she gives him injection, they're chemically immobilized. We have about 45 minutes. Um, we work fast, we take blood, we take uh, a um, DNA swab, uh, we gather measurements, obviously sex, age, all of those kinds of things. And we attach a radio collar, most important. Um, there's what the collar looks like. This is what comes off. This is what, uh, it has a little, a very small explosive mechanism and it just pulls the collar apart and then the cat can just scratch it off. Uh, usually within about 45 minutes, uh, we get done, we get them back in their cage. Um, it's usually covered. This was a very cool morning. This is Bobcat Sweetwater and you can figure out where we caught him at. A uh, young male, you can see the collar there, and we hold them in the cage until they are ready to be released and aware of where they are and whatnot. And then we open the cage and away he goes. And I actually did just get two pictures of him into our website this morning, laying up on someone's wall when their broken V is asleep. <clears throat> and if all goes well, 
Um, the collar, this is what it looks like. And they get used to a collar, just like you get used to wearing a watch. Uh, I'm sure they don't like it. I'm sure they try to get it off. But once they've had it on for a few days, it seems to just become um, part of the uh, part of their environment. Uh, this is Bobcat Margaret. So this is the Tumamak Bobcat. And she really truly and does live uh, on the hill. And I'll show you, uh, I'll talk about her specifically when we're finished with the other stuff. But she's a beautiful adult female. She's got a rock squirrel here, by the way. Okay, so we have caught 16 Bobcats. Um, we have gathered about 2000 locations already. Uh, nine are currently radio. That's how many uh, radio callers we had. Our grant was enough to let us get nine radio callers. And you can see while we started and everyone was trapped within the study area, uh, they don't really pay attention to this line. And so consequently, we've got bobcats from all the way north of Sweetwater Preserve um, to all the way south of Star Pass. And you can see here uh, where the Tumamak. Uh, bobcat is. <clears throat> so we have five adult females and four males. Uh, we were really trying to catch females and um, no offense to the guys out there, but we just do not get the same level of information from the males that we get from the females. If you think about uh, as a female, the selection, the decision she has to make about raising kittens, um, she has a lot more skin in the game, so to speak, as far as being able to find safe places and so consequently we really try to focus on the females and again if there is not successful reproduction they are not living long enough to to raise kittens to replace them you are not going to have a bobcat population over the long haul so that was important um, we're hoping to add 12 more callers and how we came up with that 12 is so each of these colors is a bobcat. This is our little female that lives on the golf course. So this is Bobcat Margaret, Bob Cave. And so our females, this is a female, this is a female. This was a female that was killed. And here's another female. Okay, so those are our five females. The rest of this is males. So you can see the home ranges are larger um, with the males. So our goal with the 12 collars is to fill in all of these areas that we don't have a female right now. And it's a pretty pretty large area. Between 10 and 14 is my guess, as far as other possible females that we might be able to capture. So that's the goal for this fall. And uh, it's a three-year study and we're in the first year. So we've got two more years to go. Um, so what have they showed us? That's the point of all this. Well, first of all, extensive use of urban areas and wildlands habitats. With the exception of this male, all of our cats use almost in equal measure uh, urban areas and wildlands. So you can see this is very dense. This is one of our males. This was a neighborhood female. This is a neighborhood female. This is Trails End, of course, Gates Pass Road. Um, <clears throat> So they really, at least in the first look, don't appear to be avoiding, if you will, um, human habitats or necessarily avoiding wildlands habitats. So this is my favorite graph because what this is, is these are building densities per square kilometer. All right, so we've had bobcats who have used um, building densities from zero out in the park out in the wildlands, all the way up to over 700, which kind of makes my stomach hurt a little bit when I think about a bobcat um, being in that high of a density. There you can see 662, that was, that's both Bobcat Margaret and Bobcat Dave down in some of those really high density neighborhoods um, east of uh, Sentinel Park. And the same here, you see some, some pretty high densities. So pretty interesting. Now, just a point to pay attention to, because I'll show you another graph in a minute. Notice these numbers over here, 1,242, almost 1,100 
really huge numbers uh, in some places. <clears throat> and I'll come back to that in a minute. So what else have they told us? Pretty good habitat, we think, because this, the home ranges are small. So our females range from a little under one square mile, which is Bobcat Minnie, who lives on a golf course, uh, to Bobcat Margaret, who lives uh, on to Mamak Hill and moves in and out of urban areas. So, so one to three square miles is, is a small home range, fairly small home range for Bobcats. Give you some perspective. Uh, my Bobcats uh, females in the Eastern deciduous forest used up to 11 square miles. So they used a much, much larger area. The males uh, from about four to about 14. This guy, uh, this is Bobcat Hal. We caught him in Felix Paseo Park. And he's managed to come in contact with all of our females on the northern half of our study area. So he's kind of the player. Um, another thing that's interesting is, and this is a perfect example here, this is Bobcat Shannon in the red, and this is Bobcat Morgan in the green, and we caught them within a couple hundred yards of each other, but you notice that there's almost no overlap. So all of the overlap that you see is from males overlapping with females, okay? So this was, this was Bobcat Catherine, and then Shannon, uh, Morgan, and many, and again, this was Bobcat Dave who overlapped with her, and you can see he overlapped extensively. Um, so the females are, are pretty much um, single in their home ranges as far as other females go. There are more than one to three males, probably more than that, that overlap with the female. The males overlap extensively. This whole tangle of locations out here is all males. Um, <clears throat> so why is that important? Well, it's, it's what you would expect. It's the way that the social structure of bobcat populations work, which tells us that, yes, this is a population that lives in urban areas, but a bobcat is a bobcat. They are doing exactly what bobcats should be doing. Um, this, is, this is a two week example of their movements. And what you notice right away is in a two week span, the females use all of their home range. And it's usually back and forth several times. This is a perfect example. They are busy butts. They do not stop. Um, on average, uh, our females are well over a mile a day. The males do not. The males during the breeding season use much larger home ranges and then Right now, females are all pregnant or having kittens. The males are staying home. It'll be interesting to see if that changes as we go uh, farther along. So bottom line, bobcats move a lot. Again, why is that important? Again, it gives you some perspective, very in line with what we see with wild bobcat or with wildlands bobcats. It's just, it just is what bobcats do. Okay, so the bigger picture. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned the study area and we'll do our trapping there, but another, uh, we really look at all of Tucson as part of the study. And I know some of you have sent in uh, locations to the website, and if so, you're one of these data points. So these are all locations that uh, people in Tucson have sent us since we went live on our website in November with Bobcat photographs and information about Bobcat activities. So remember when I said, you notice this area where there's over a thousand buildings per square miles, you notice that there are no locations there. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see if that fills in or if in fact, this is just too dense. Um, our goal this year is, to, as I mentioned before, to fill in in our study area, but we also really wanna be able to capture some bobcats that are in more of this Eastern area. So um, if you see a bobcat, if you are lucky enough to have bobcats at your house, then by all means, um, let us know, uh, report a bobcat. We love getting sightings of radio cats. So I know all of you share Margaret's home range. And if you see Margaret, even if you don't have a picture, 
We love to hear that from people. It's great just to know what they're doing. <clears throat> okay, so the other thing that we're doing as part of this is um, looking at where our females have their kittens. So just a little bit of information about bobcat reproduction. Um, cats in general, and this includes bobcats, typically are single moms, okay? There are a few exceptions, but by and large, um, the males do not help. They, they provide their DNA, but other than that, the, male, the females raise the kittens on their own. Um, part of why they're so busy when they have kittens. So some of the questions that we were asking, when are kittens born? Gosh, that seems like such a simple question. In reality, bobcats can have kittens every month of the year and do have kittens every month of the year. And that's not just in the desert. So what happens is there's a focus breeding season. Um, ours looks to be kind of mid-January to mid-February. We're still sorting on that. And then everyone tries to have kittens about now. We're in the midst of our kitten season. If she raises those kittens, then those kittens stay with her and then they become uh, independent sometime before she breeds and has more kittens or really before she has more kittens. There's a lot of variation. Um, if she loses those kittens, she goes, become very quickly comes back into estrus, breeds and has kittens again in a matter of uh, 10 days after she's lost kittens, she's rebred. And if that happens again, the same thing happens again. So consequent, consequently, if she's losing litters of kittens, she just keeps trying. Our bobcats in Ohio uh, all raised a litter a year. Some of them lost litters, but they all persisted and ended up raising at least one kitten from that litter. And then of course, where do females have and raise their kittens? Um, people say, well, you know, why do you have to put a radio collar on? We see them all the time. They're incredibly secretive. Um, they, it's probably the most important decision she makes. Uh, what is a safe place for the kittens? And something to remember is again, a cat is a cat is a cat, that these guys are just as helpless as domestic house cat kittens are for that first six to eight weeks. Um, and she's out hunting, so she can't stay there and defend or protect. So what we found in Ohio, these huge log piles, which was impossible to find where she was in there, these were extremely successful because if she has 10 or 15 or 20 ways in and out in many, many places to stash the kittens, it's hard for predator to find it. Um, this was one of my favorites. This was a log that was left over from logging. And when I saw her, she was backing out of the log. She could just barely fit in there. I think she met, spent most of her time laying up on top of it when she wasn't feeding the kittens. And I do believe that uh, Eastern bobcats were cavity nesters when there were breeze. This was a, um, again, a successful den. This is a fire scar and a beautiful cavity in there. Um, she could watch what was going on all the time. So where do Tucson bobcats have and raise their kittens? Well, again, if she's used to living in an urban area, a flat roof on a house is a pie. It looks like a rock pile. It gives her some protection. A space under a deck um, may look like a brush pile. And so this part of this study was one that I personally was very interested in. And bottom line is, like all mothers, she's going to select a place that she feels safe and where she believes her hope considers that her kids will be safe. Uh, I love the picture. This one came in just last week and I don't know where this person lives, but I wanna go stay at their house because this is amazing. Um, it is truly a, a unique thing about Tucson uh, that Bobcats share uh, our city and our environment to the level that they do. These are all pictures. I love this one. She's nursing her kittens on um, the patio. Uh, table and getting a drink and of course everybody likes to roll around in the lawn. Um, so all pictures of Tucson bobcats raising kittens in Tucson. Um, this is Margaret. So I'll give you a little background on her now. And um, Margaret is an older female. She had had kittens. So we know uh, 
our female, black females start having kittens as earliest as two. And so Margaret had had and raised kittens and she actually had a little bit of wear on her teeth. So Margaret's probably, and also just looking at her face, I'm guessing that Margaret was probably at least five years old. Um, this was us handling her. So these are, these are warmies. Uh, it was cold that day. And so there's the radio collar. And she was one of our larger females. She weighed, uh, I think Margaret weighed almost 16 pounds. She is named after uh, our veterinarian, Dr. Erica Johnson's grandmother. We use our names, uh, our Bobcat names, to honor people who have helped with the study or have helped us get to where we are um, in our lives. Uh, it, they're not just a number, doesn't anthropomorphize them. It's just simply a, a way to uh, honor people and be able to have individual names. I have to point this out about Margaret because this was the, this was the quest of the flea. Um, the whole time that we were catching bobcats, our veterinarian was trying to catch fleas and Ohio bobcats crawled with fleas, but we could not find a flea to save our life. Um, and finally, Margaret had one in her ear. So this is the tiniest flea I've ever seen but Dr. Johnson was able to catch it and we put it in um, alcohol and actually uh, it's having its DNA analyzed. Um, hopefully as we speak, we'll find out what kind of flea it is. A lot of species have species specific parasites. So things like fleas for instance, but that was, uh, that was one thing that Margaret contributed. All right, so, this is Margaret's home range. These are all of her locations. So you can see she really um, is very much sharing the same home range that you share when you're out on the mountain. Uh, let's see if I can, this does not show her actual location. I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, this is another thing Barbara, Margaret contributed to uh, what we know about bobcats. Um, she was down, has been down there twice that we got pictures, but I think she's been down there more than that. This is water in the Santa Cruz. So I'm sure most of you know about that project. And um, the folks that are monitoring this project were very excited to see uh, Bobcat use back down in that riverbed. Considering the busy roads that she crossed to get there, uh, I'm not so much. Okay. So I mentioned the 14 days and the fact that they use their whole home range in 14 days. This is the last 14 days for Margaret. I printed this out um, this afternoon. And a couple of things to note. First of all, where we caught her uh, is right here. So we, we walked in from Mission uh, down in a wash and that's where we captured her. And you notice that by and large, we captured her on the edge of her home range, which is pretty common for a number of our females. Um, I've mentioned several times that we're in the midst of kitten season and Margaret has led us on a merry chase. Uh, basically, what we thought would happen is that they, we would, uh, they would stay with the kittens for a couple days when the kittens are born, which is what happened in Ohio uh, and with other uh, Eastern studies, and they do not. They are uh, out and about very quickly after the kittens are born. So consequently, we're having a hard time locating our dens. Um, so basically, if you look at a cluster of locations like this one, for instance, above Star Pass here, above Star Pass Road, we thought, aha, there it is. She stayed there, she went back there, and then she didn't, and then, Last week, I got a hold of Trika and I said, I think she's had her kittens up behind the buildings at the lab, and then she didn't. And she moved again. And now I think that she has had her kittens. I'll show you a close up. If you look at this cluster right here, um, this is the observatory. So most of you can get a little bit oriented. And this is from this morning, so you can see these locations, um, four different locations there, uh, all very close together. So 
Uh, here's what we know about bobcats now in Tucson that we didn't know before is that if you look in their home range and pick the nastiest, highest, steepest, cliffiest spot, that's probably where they're going to have their kittens. Um, they, we spent the weekend chasing them around and it was very humbling because they are tough spots to get to. I did a master's on black bears and this felt a lot like going to bear dens. So very, very <clears throat> cool from that standpoint. So stay tuned. I will um, keep you posted uh, on what happens as far as uh, Margaret and the kittens go. Um, all right, so just to kind of wrap things up, uh, we believe that the apparently large and thriving bobcat population in around Tucson should be a point of pride for the Tucson community. It is a, a unique situation. Uh, if you go to Phoenix, there will be bobcats all around the edges. Many places have bobcats all around the edges. Some of you may have heard about the research over in California with um, mountain lions and bobcats in Santa Monica National uh, Recreation Area. Those bobcats come down into urban areas to feed, but they go back up uh, into the park the rest of the time. Our bobcats are integrated into our communities. Uh, I think it's a reflection of historic and ongoing efforts, and some of you have been involved in these, that set aside large and small tracts of wildlands and throughout Tucson, there are green spaces and there are wildlands. And a lot of work has been done and continues to be done about protecting travel ways, protecting washes, of course, the river uh, bottoms, all of those are important for bobcats to be, and, and other species as well, to be able to move from one place to the other. <clears throat> and then finally, it also shows that peaceful coexistence between species is both spot possible and beneficial to both. Um, I've gotten emails, this particular female raised her kittens three or four years in the same backyard and she would um, leave the kittens and go hunting. There was a wall around the yard that she couldn't, the kittens couldn't get out. So she felt secure in that. And the people would make a noise when they wanted to go in the backyard and the kittens would run up the tree and everybody did fine. Everyone gave a little and, and uh, it was a very, very amazing experience to get to watch this uh, out your window. Um, many of the spotted cats around the world are endangered. We have a tremendous number of bobcats in the United States, in Arizona, and in Tucson. They're very common and yet incredibly uh, spectacular to be able to see. So as I mentioned, we just started. Um, we do have a long-term goal. We really want to create an ongoing Bobcats in Tucson conservation program um, that includes research, but also is about public awareness and appreciation. And so this study is a scientific study, but this study is really all about how can we integrate um, humans and bobcats and what can they show us, what can they teach us uh, here in Tucson? So it's a different perspective than what you would normally think of. So our funding, I mentioned already, um, we got a grant for about $35,000 from the Heritage Fund. Um, we're all volunteers. So all of, our, all of us biologists and the veterinarians, uh, we're all donating our time and expertise Truthfully, for me, this is a labor of love. Um, I would probably have gone anywhere to be able to uh, do what I'm doing with these cats. So our, our donations, you can donate. They go directly to purchase equipment and supplies, um, mostly radio collars. I mentioned that we're trying to raise funds for 12 more radio collars, and they're expensive, about $2,300 each. Um, our goal is to raise $35,000 for 12 additional callers. Right now we have raised about 12,000, so we have enough for about four more callers. Uh, you can donate uh, on the website and uh, on the How Can I Help banner, you can donate, you can um, send in a location and you can take the survey all in the same place. 
And in all of your cases, since you have access to a radio collar bobcat, um, hopefully you can also send in some sightings. So I appreciate the time and the attention. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I got a little tease out there to keep you interested. I spoke with Trika this afternoon and I'm willing to, uh, once we can all be together again, we're moving towards that, come and uh, spend some time with any of you who are interested and um, get some locations on Margaret where you can hear her and just kind of do a hands-on kind of uh, workshop, bring skulls and skins and talk bobcats, one of my favorite things to do. All right, thanks so much. Wow, awesome. I guess this means that you're now ready to take um, questions, Cheryl, I, questions, comments. I am. And you can either raise your hands uh, or just unmute yourself and speak up. Um, I think we'll honor all. I'm going to try to see raised hands there. Um, I'll, I'll start off with the question, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. I don't see anything just yet. Um, you said you're going to do some more captures in the fall. That's mm -hmm. correct. It's going to go in the fall. And then do you have a targeted number of, and it looks like you're going to focus on females. Um, or do you have a targeted number that you're going to be collaring at that point? Well, we're hoping if we can, if we can raise the money for the 12 callers, that's what we'll shoot for. And so what we'll do is we'll actually, um, have a trapping time in, uh, November. And we'll be trying to capture more females, but we'll also be capturing, if we can, any of our cats that have been radioed for a year. And we'll exchange those collars. So we'll change out their collars, give them new collars. And then we can send those radio collars back and get them refurbished. So about half as much to, to get them refurbished. And then we'll do another trapping time in January and get those refurbished collars out. So however many we end up with, um, we'll do two different trapping periods to try to get those out. This year, uh, we did our initial trapping in November, and then we had a couple more tallities. So then we went back out in uh, February and did a week trapping and got three more cats radioed. So right now we're up and going with nine. And then um, the ones that you refurbish, is that because the batteries on those, they're only pretty much a year long, or is that the collars you're going with? Yeah, the, the batteries, um, so our male batteries can last up to two years and the females uh, 16 months. And that's just totally has to do with how many locations we get and how much time um, we can hear the signal on the ground. Okay, so those are the two things that, that so you're always balancing. So for instance, next year, there'll be a program in there to give locations every two hours that I can do when I think there's a den, because then I won't be climbing ridiculous hills and not finding anything. Um, so, and then also the other thing that, uh, that we're hoping is gonna happen is there has been a tremendous amount of interest from um, the county, from planners um, about the travel ways and about where they're crossing roads. And, you know, um, and so if you think of right now, we have a six hour path every six hours. I mentioned how much they travel. So there's a straight line, but it doesn't really show what they did. And so even the two hour won't, but it'll be better in hopes that we can provide some of that information about are they using culverts? You know, how are they crossing? We did have a uh, roadkill. We did have a mortality up on Trails End. He was only radio collared for two weeks and um, he, he got, at least that's what we, we, we weren't able to recover carcass. So we just had to take the person's word for it. Yeah, it was a strange situation. But anyway, um, he sent in an anonymous email and said that he had accidentally ran over or accidentally hit him with a vehicle and then he left the collar in Felix Paseo Park and we were able to find the collar. So very strange. So yeah, um, so the refurbish is battery. That's the main um, thing is the battery. And then you put a new collar on and just, you know, kind of generally get it back to 
new again. So we've got a, a question here from Lauren, who's asking if they, if bobcats um, actually compete with coyotes at all in, in prey or territory. Oh yeah, I, I think in both. Um, absolutely, there are coyotes in in bobcats' home ranges and bobcats in coyotes' home ranges, and you know the diet certainly overlaps. And I suspect that coyotes are probably a significant, uh, along with domestic dogs, a sin significant predator on the kittens if they can, uh, if they can catch the kittens or find the kittens. So yeah, absolutely. Is really? that at all reversed? <laughs> Would uh, bobcats ever take a coyote kit pup? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I think that both that goes both ways. And I don't know, Ron's Ron's on board, and he can talk about this way better than I can, but. Um, what I have seen, uh, it's, it's kind of an impasse. It's kind of like whoever has the advantage is gonna take the advantage. So if, if a bobcat can pick off a small coyote, we had bobcats that caught bear cubs, um, which was real interesting. And it, yeah, and ate them when they were very small. So, you know, that is always going on. It's kind of who has the advantage. But I've also seen bobcats back off coyotes from a food source. So for instance, uh, a roadkill deer or something, the bobcat will be there and the coyotes give. So I think it, it's a lot of back and forth uh, on that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, I'd love to encourage others to ask questions, speak up. This has been an incredibly awesome presentation and really relevant to us right here at Tumamoc. Um, there, there was a question that I saw come up on chat Cheryl, on how many bobcats are in the study area? I'd like to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did you ask that question, Carrie? <laughs> no, no, Mary, good for you, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, we're probably, um, we're probably, uh, we'll probably answer that question. I, I, I would again, go back to the home range sizes and you can look at the males overlapping and what the females do. And so, you know, I'm guessing that we probably have several more females. Uh, there's some young bobcats out there too that we won't radio collar, but several form females. And there's some pretty big gaps where there are no males either. So we we probably don't have, I don't think we have half caught. Ron, what do you think? You wanna chip in? Carrie, <laughs> put you guys on the spot. What do you think, Ron? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think there's quite a few there that we have not caught yet. Um, just, uh, yeah, I agree. I think we're probably uh, half-ish, uh, maybe a little less than half. Yeah, I think what, looking at the, the data um, has been most enlightening to us. Is I think we all, we all had perceptions and they were different perceptions of how many bobcats we might see, but to then see the home ranges coming out so clearly, especially for the females and how they're particularly aligning with each other uh, is giving us a good indicator that, hey, we do have a lot of space for more bobcats. And I, I think we're gonna see, personally, I think we're gonna see a fairly significant turnover of that urbanized population over the study period. Um, uh, that's, uh, we don't have the collars, unfortunately, to put on some of the young kittens and see where they go. Uh, but there's a lot of production, I think, in there. And uh, some are just folding into existing habitats. Others are moving totally out of the study area itself. So I think it's also important when you think about the population, it's not just the adult population but you really need to think about that female and, and the kittens uh, in that association as well. Great, thanks Carrie and Ron and Cheryl. Here's another question um, from Aaron. Um, and I've got several questions lined up. Yay, thanks everyone. Um, are the individuals actually queuing into the urban wild interface and carving their home range? to take advantage of that edge. And then there's a second part of that question. Um, and then within a sex, is the home range size actually smaller along that edge 
suggesting it's higher quality. I'm assuming the higher quality of that home range, right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think we know yet. Um, so all we can do so far is compare uh, with research in other places. And there are two long-term studies on urban uh, bobcat populations, one in South Carolina, one in California. And they saw fairly small home ranges and suspect then fairly high quality habitat. Um, I don't think that they're necessarily carving out along that interface. We specifically tried to catch them along that interface. Um, and, I, and I mentioned, you know, we're gonna try to move east because now the questions that come to my mind based on what we've seen with our females is, okay, what happens if you don't have a cliffy, high, wildlands, rocky kind of a spot to raise your kittens? Is that then where you are on someone's roof for, and their bougainvilleas or wherever it happens to be? And second part of that that Aaron mentioned is, is that a better home range or a, a higher or lower quality home range based on size? And so that's definitely one of our questions um, to see. Uh, I personally think, and again, Carrie and Ron can kick in on this. I personally think that is a really good place to live where you have choices like that. Um, mm -hmm. Because I think they go in, I mentioned we get pictures of them, you know, sitting under people's bird feeders and at water. I mean, there's tremendous water availability. There's tremendous food availability. The balance point is it's dangerous too. I mean, you're crossing roads, you're interacting with a species that is as warlike if they as they get, if you will, with humans. You know, two two of our mortalities were definitely not vehicle strikes. They were intentional. You know, people killed them, and so that's where that trade off comes. I think. Yeah, I think as you move as you move east, you get in and and get up over the river system. You get into a, a, I think it's going to be a sink uh, where we're going to lose bobcats pretty quickly because their options tend to go away. And there, there's a PhD student working at the university right now, and she's putting cameras down in those major drainages. And her camera information is matching what we're getting in terms of reports from the public. That same hole is in her data set right now. She's not seeing bobcats on on the cameras but as you move north and you get into the pantano and uh, uh, cañado del oro um, those provide a really great movement corridor and so you've got bobcats using that corridor and moving outward from it uh, into those urbanized areas so it, it's like cheryl said i think it provides them that ability to move back and forth depending on what they think they need at a particular time uh, and not totally in a, a, a high density urbanized area all the time. That also speaks to the importance of corridors uh, through the city. If there's this big hole in the middle, are they able to connect? Um, and what but... we think, yeah, and what we think of corridors, uh, we are really thinking in terms of really high quality corridors compared to what they use. So corridors to them can be a fairly small ribbon of vegetation and, and a dry wash that they can move back and forth that we wouldn't think of as a corridor, but for them it is. And I think that's hopefully our data will kind of show some of those travel zones that way that, you know, it doesn't have to be an un, uninhabited long section, wide section of uh, mesquite gallery along the river bottom. Yeah. yeah, good point. Which also speaks to people uh, creating habitat within their own neighborhoods and homes. Um, but I'm going to jump to some other questions because we've got some great ones coming in. Um, Anna's asking what kind of community outreach would be most beneficial to engage neighborhoods where some of the bobcats are located? And are you doing any community outreach that way? Well, I heard that part. Yeah. <laughs> um, obviously, COVID made a huge difference in our approach because we really uh, uh, intended this to be a 
you know, kind of at the neighborhood level, a lot of the surveying, for instance, and, and outreach would be at the neighborhood level to try to, to interact with people. Um, and we went with the website uh, because of the inability to do that. And I actually think in the long run, it's been better because it has, we always looked at this as all of Tucson, but people tend to focus on the radio cats and the other information that we're gathering is just as important. And um, the surveys, you know, we, we've got, I don't know, Carrie, we're well over 700, maybe 800 surveys that people have sent in. And so that that's a much broader perspective. I'm still hoping um, and that was part of what I hope we can do on the Hill with Margaret to be able to do some, you know, some neighborhood level stuff. Um, I do, we do have people in neighborhoods who have made themselves part of the project, um, just sort of pushed their way in literally. Um, Gail Sherman, who's our photographer now, lives on the golf course and she just, is our person now. And now all the golf course stuff goes through Gail because people know her and they're way more comfortable, you know, contacting her. So we have a few of those and I hope we get more of them. Um, this has to be community based for, you know, for this to work for the Bobcats. And that's the bottom line because it, it does require some tolerance and it does require people to be willing to, you know, give a little. And so, um, but to get back to your question on the community outreach, I don't turn down programs. I will always give a program when someone asks. And, you know, I think um, any way that we can let people know uh, about the study and about Bobcats is all good. So um, please pass it on, send it on. Um, you know, talk about it, whatever. We have little business cards we can send you to hand out if you want them. Uh, we've just tried every way we could to get the word out. Yeah, Cheryl was talking, we, we have about approaching 800 finished surveys and we have a 100% completion rate. <laughs> and out of 800, nobody's failed to do the survey. It takes about four and a half, five minutes, but that, that's an amazing number if you do surveys. And then the other part of it is, is taking a look at um, the information that we're getting back from the sightings, that's continuing to grow. That's the biggest outreach thing. And, and the website's giving us 25, has been giving us 2,500 to 3,000 hits a, a month, uh, which is great for, you know, again, a research project um, and, and a little bit of a different approach to it. So, you know, from an outreach point of view, we really encourage people just go to the bobcatsintucson.net website and follow that. And that's gonna take you a variety of directions. And Cheryl tries to get blog uh, reports up there from time to time for people. That's great. We're kind of like Pavlov's dog. If you ring the bell, we'll salivate. <laughs> well, um... So I'm seeing that it's, we've got about 10 more minutes. I'd like to squeeze a few more of these great questions in here. Um, I'm seeing about four more. I'm gonna jump to um, Chrissy's question on how far will grown kittens travel to find vacant territory? And before you answer that one, Cheryl, her second part of that question, which is, it's, is why is there pushback regarding the release of collars or is the pushback just about collars in general? And I can tell you, um, Chrissy, it's, it's primarily more about the pushback about callers in general. Um, people do, I know, have a, um, um, you know, a, they can be against people manipulating wildlife in any way when they don't really understand the project. And you all now understand the project so much better. And I'm, so you can speak to that a little bit more, Cheryl, regarding the pushback, but especially that first part of the question, how far will go and grown kittens travel to find vacant territory. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So the pushback, um, a lot of it centers on, well, they're gonna have to wear it the rest of their life. We, we hear that one a lot. And then, as you said, um, you know, I, I had a comment today, well, they seem to be doing fine. Why don't you just leave them alone? And um, 
I actually, my response, and I, I didn't have a chance to talk about this, but I would encourage any of you uh, who are interested in urban bobcats to go to um, uh, Bobcat Guardians. If you just Google Bobcat Gar Guardians, uh, Kiowa Island in South Carolina has done research for 30 years. And um, they have an amazing situation there. It's unfortunately also in California. So the two long-term studies have both ended up showing a very serious rodenticide problem for bobcats. And it would never, we would have not known if there weren't radio bobcats dying. I mean, literally. So, so those kinds of things are real direct. As far as how far will they travel? Holy cow. Um, I can tell you a personal story of one that was a juvenile male, a one-year-old male uh, in Ohio, and he traveled 70 miles over the course of almost a year before he finally found a home range. Um, I do know of one that I, I think the I think the the highest is like 150 miles a male, and that was from Indiana Indiana to Ohio. He got killed in Ohio. Um, most of the time, it isn't that far or that extreme. What happens is they start to move. So, so most of the males disperse. A um, lot of lack of understanding about how many females disperse, but I suspect if she can carve out or push her way in with her mother nearby, or if someone, if there's a vacant home range, she's going to stick around more. Um, that's a pretty common, not just with bobcats. And um, if she does move, uh, I had a female that we captured who was still dispersing. She moved about eight more miles after we captured her over the course of about two, three months. What happens is they stop and they're there for a while. And then I think they get kicked out. So the resident kicks them out and then they go a little farther and they stop and then they hang out and they get kicked out again. And I think that's what goes on um, as far as that goes. So um, yeah, we, we do not, will not put any uh, radios on what we think are sub adults or juveniles. Everybody's an adult as far as we can tell. Good Great. question. It is, thanks Cheryl. I'm. I'll get back to your question, uh, Lauren, but I'm gonna jump to Eric's question real quick um, because it's it's a pretty straightforward question. It's a really good one. Eric's asking if bobcats are occurring or setting up their dens in areas that are um, closer to water. Is that more important to them or is it more about finding food? Um, I actually don't think it's either. Um... I would have said that they would have picked the best food places um, because they get a lot of their water from their food, obviously. But I think that they, my sense after working with uh, the females in Ohio and now what I'm seeing here is I think they pick what they think is the safest place. Because um, so predator wise, we talked about coyotes a little bit, domestic dogs, um, the other, predator on bobcat kittens is male bobcats. Okay, so if a male, he recognizes the females, they communicate via a lot of marking and scent and whatnot. If he comes upon kittens of a female he didn't breed with, he'll kill those kittens. And that's because we talked about the fact they come right back into estrus and rebreed. Um, you know, cats are the ultimate promiscuous reproductive strategy. Uh, I used to always tease my students about, you know, the comparison with college students, but they really are. And they very quickly rebreed and have kits again. So I think she picks that site for security. They are so mobile. She goes wherever she needs to go to hunt. Um, we've not seen them, you know, really shrink down their areas. So Great. And great question, Eric. Thank you. Um, Meanwhile, Lauren said she found the answer to her question on your website. I just wanted to point out she was asking where one would report um, a bobcat sighting. Um, I shared that with you all previously. I'll share it in a follow up, but it's bobcatsintucson.net. And there's a place on there where you can report bobcat sightings. Um, so I'm going to jump back to another question that Chrissy has. Um, 
and that's what's the difference in life and expectancy uh, between wild and urban um, and wildland urban and the wildland urban interface and and that's a great question because I know that I've worked with various wildlife and in captivity they last a lot longer because they're just so pampered and out in the wild eh, not so much so I really appreciate that question Chrissy and are you all seeing a difference or do you know of a difference we don't know yet um and and you know that's part of the question we're asking and and fortuitously for us game and fish is also doing a statewide bobcat study so we're going to have some great comparison um we already have comparisons with den sites and whatnot so we'll have some comparisons on mortality uh we we were very worried early on because we had um within we started trapping in November and by the end of January, we had lost three of our radio cats. And I was, we were thinking, you know, wow, this is not gonna go well at all. Um, I mentioned already two of those were direct human caused. One we think was a vehicle strike. We did not get any anything back from that person other than the, the radio. And so um, it started out that way. We were concerned since then, knock on wood, things have been quiet. Other studies that have been done, um, if you set aside the rodenticide problem, uh, fairly high survival for herb objects. But um, compared to Wildlands, it's hard to, to make that jump because there are different, um, you know, threats uh, between the two. But um, uh, bottom line is they need to live long enough to at least replace themselves in the population for the population to continue uh, on as it is or to increase if they can do more than replace themselves. So stay tuned on that one. <laughs> And definitely stay tuned, everyone. And you all heard Cheryl mention that she is offering to do an in-person workshop with us um, with uh, some hands-on uh, skulls, skins, sounds, maps. Um, and we can also potentially listen to any cats that are in the vicinity. So as we're able to get um, in proximity, um, we'll certainly um, take you up on that, Cheryl, and um, you'll keep us posted, I know, and I would really urge all of you to get onto that website, make reports. Um, do you do um, updates or do you just want people to, you do send updates if people register on your mm -hmm. site there? Yeah. Yeah, you can register um, on the blog. It's just, uh, it, I send up, I'm actually way overdue, but I try to send out one about every week to two weeks and just whatever's going on at the particular time. And then Trika, I will also update you on Margaret in particular, so you can pass that on to everybody. Um, yeah, for sure. So fingers crossed that We'll have a done site soon. <laughs> yeah, I'll keep it. I'll keep everyone posted. We're excited to hear about her and um, kind of a fun yeah. one. I, I when we were working on Margaret and she was dropping down into the Santa Cruz, I got a hold of uh, Tucson Parks and Recreation. I wanted to make sure we were clear for uh, ability to get onto the park and and track down. At one point, we thought we had a mortality going, and so we were needing to get on the park to find that and. And it was just a little blip in the, the system at the time. But when I got to the Parks and Rec Department, it got shuttled to the manager of Sentinel Peak Park. This gentleman was adamant. We don't have bobcats on my park. There's no <laughs> bobcats in this area. And so turn around and faxed him a copy of all the locations and said, I'm not sure that's the case you know here, here's margaret and here's your area so there's still a lot of uh and, and when we were down in the barrio there on the east side uh looking at dave uh the mortality on that big male um essentially we got a mortality signal and and the collar was in the bottom of a dumpster and so that's we were able to track the collar back to the dumpster and at that point 
talking with people in the neighborhood, um, we were allocated moved to a, a particular individual who had been very vocal about any neighborhood dogs getting out and hurting his chickens were going to get killed. So we were pretty sure that's what happened to Dave. But the people we talked to, 75% uh, didn't have a clue that there were bobcats moving back and forth through their neighborhood there at, at Grande and Congress and, um, and that kind of thing. So we really see that either we have a group of people that are tuned to bobcats and are aware of them and have seen them or don't even have an idea they're there. So well, maybe at some point in the future, we can do a, a tabling event um, yeah. on Tumamok, which we have done in the past. And we would invite um, you all here, our Tumamok stewards, and of course you all, Cheryl, to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, we get a lot of people yeah. walking and I think that would be a great thing to mm -hmm. do to to share yeah. with uh, a broader audience. Um, and Absolutely. I'm going to have to say, I'm going to honor everyone's time. It's just after seven o'clock right now. This has been really fascinating. I suspect we could uh, probably keep on going, but um, we do tend to stay on our time schedule here just to honor everyone as volunteers coming here um, to contribute to, um, you know, the everyone's efforts at Tim and Mock Hill. And um, thank you so much, Cheryl. Awesome program. Mm -hmm. um, we did you. record it when that's all ready and rendered. We will share that with everyone, including you, Cheryl. Um, and mm -hmm. we all thank you so much. Um, and with that, we'll say good night. I see thank yous popping up. Thank you all. <laughs> Thanks for all you do. Absolutely. Good night, Thank everyone. You too. Good night.